Hi, everyone. I'm Timothy Jordan, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, open source and AI. So um, let me actually pull up my notes on my phone, since they're not on the screen. That's OK. Uh, so among the things I do at Google include uh, open source and AI DevRel. And I also founded the TensorFlow DevRel team several years ago, so I'm really passionate about this space. Uh, now, I'm sure I'm not the most expert on AI and open source in the room, but I know a little bit uh, to get myself in trouble. Now, some of you are the experts in this particular subject on open source and AI. But I suspect many of you haven't jumped into the deep end just yet. I'm here today to get more open source experts like you involved in this conversation because we need you to help land it well and to land it quickly. Now, I'm going to go into a bit more detail, and I hope that when I'm done, uh, you'll be excited to start, the, start to play more with these open models and to join the uh, OSI community-driven conversation deep dive in AI. All right, now I need to spend uh, probably very little on this slide. Everybody in this room knows the power of open source. We all know uh, that these licenses give users creative autonomy to drive creativity and collaboration, and also that it can be modified to fit custom and unique use cases. And Google believes in the power of open technology. But what does it mean to be open? Well, we know from the open source definition that uh, open source should allow derivative works and innovation from first principles. Now, this latter point is where it gets challenging with AI. Now, I personally assumed that for open source and AI, at the beginning of this conversation that we're having together, that you would need to have the full data set and that you would need to have full access to all the training code uh, to permit innovating from first principles, like not just derivative works. But I'm pretty sure I was wrong about that. <laughs> After examining things in more detail uh, and having conversations with people that were more expert in AI and open source than I am, uh, I've learned that the actual reality is a bit more complicated and complex. Now, let's, let's a, take a look at uh, this just in a bit more detail. For these open source models, they're certainly more complicated than this, they're more complex than this. Uh, but for purposes of our conversation, we can look at these three big areas. There's the data used to train the models. There's the training code. Uh, and there's the resulting weights, right? And most of our open models now are just these resulting weights. Um, for open source, uh, because these models use a tremendous amount of data, it may not be easily packaged or even possible to collect all that data in one place. And the code is sometimes used in proprietary systems. So that's not actually particularly useful more broadly. And then, of course, training on the full data set could require resources well beyond the reach of most open source developers. So even if this code was shared, it wouldn't actually have the desired effect of allowing people to innovate from first principles. Now, if you were to ask me today, what would the right solution be? Well, I think it's probably something along the lines of uh, uh, the data definition and some samples of what that would look like. Uh, training code that, uh, uh, like an example implementation of the training code on OSS frameworks. Um, and then it's actually plausible to train those models on your own particular use case. Now, I'm not sure that that's exactly it, but I think that's the nuance of where the conversation is currently at. And actually, there's some more nuances that we can discuss. When it comes to AI, we're also seeing rapidly evolving policy and case law around copyright that makes a difference. This is a selfie. No, it's not a selfie of me. Uh, this is Naruto. He's a, a macaw monkey um, who took their own picture with a camera left unattended by a photographer. Now, this adorable monkey, it turns out, was held uh, that he, he could not possess the legal standing to sue for copyright infringement. And it's now cited as reference in works by AI. Now, we haven't reached the end of this story and what it really means for this field, uh, but it's another example of the complexities at play when we consider licenses. 
And of course, while open source offers many benefits, it also presents some novel challenges around safety and misuse for AI, particularly at scale. They really are new and unique in this space. All right, so that's a lot of the nuance and how it's sort of tricky and complicated, but why am I talking about this right now? Why does it matter right now? Well, this is the most accessible, easiest, available, ubiquitous, and approachable that AI has ever been. I mean, think about it. AI is in most of the things you already know and love, like traditional models running on your phone's camera. Your camera's phone? Your phone's camera, that's the one. Um, generative AI usage across the business spectrum and like so many more things. But particularly for this audience, it's the most accessible it's ever been for developers. I'm gonna give you an example. It's a little bit crazy, but I think in a 10 minute talk, I can do a demo around just this. Can we go to the, the demo screen? All right, so I'm just gonna, this quick example to demonstrate like how easy it is to run these models right now. Um, I've got Wi-Fi off, I'm just gonna do this locally. I'm using this getting started example on LLM inference on MediaPipe Studio, which is a, a really easy way to run these models locally on device, uh, which means I head over to Kaggle, my favorite place to get open models, and I download Gemma, which I did before conference Wi-Fi, and I head over to GitHub and I download uh, some JavaScript and HTML. Um, I'm gonna use the uh, JavaScript version of this example and it's, it's in the MediaPipe GitHub repository. So if you look at my, let's see here, clear the directory, I've got the model, I've got some JavaScript, I've got HTML, and I'm just gonna run a local server with Python. And there we are. All right, let me go ahead and copy the prompt that I came up with earlier. Write me a haiku about open source software. So you can see, uh, you might have seen it a, mom uh, a moment ago that it just loaded the model. I've put in this prompt, I get response, and there's the model running locally. Code shared, free and bright, power for everyone to see, innovation takes flight. That's actually kind of lovely. That's a demo. <laughs> of running this stuff in under, what, 60 seconds? Back to the slides. This is exactly what I mean, but it's the most approachable it's ever been for developers. Okay, so what's next? Well, we all keep working together. I think collaboration is the key for developing safe and responsible AI. Investing in research, developing safety tools tailored for openly available AI, collaborating with policymakers, and engaging with the cybersecurity community. We believe that by sharing Gemma models and fostering a diverse community that we can collectively advance the field of AI. Now these Gemma models are released as open models, providing free access to model weights while ensuring responsible usage through specific terms of use. And in parallel, by working as a broader open source community, on the definition of open source for AI, so critical, we'll find the right way to ensure that this field continues to drive innovation, creativity, and collaboration. Thank you. <laughs>